welcome to Open Source Computer Science. Today, I want to introduce you to a book series that has been considered the Bible of computer science, namely The Art of Computer Programming by Donald Knuth, which covers many kinds of programming algorithms and their mathematical analysis. Now, this book series is not an introductory guide to programming by any means, and it is generally considered difficult to learn from these books alone. Therefore, I found it stunning to find out that there seems to be no video series that gives you some visual intuition on the mathematical concepts presented in this book. For this reason, the goal of this video is to do just that. Concretely, in this video I will introduce you to the first mathematical definition you will encounter when you start reading these books, namely a mathematical definition of an algorithm. So, to start, what is an algorithm on a high level? Well, we could essentially describe it as a black box that takes in an input and produces an output, where this black box contains the instructions that tell the computer what it needs to do with the input to produce the associated output. To make this a little bit more concrete, we will, throughout this video, consider the following algorithm. The maximum value in a list, abbreviated to max. This algorithm takes in any list of integers and returns the highest integer in the given list. For example, the list 251 would result in 5, and the list negative 3, negative 10, negative 6 would result in negative 3. We could translate this idea of a black box mapping inputs to outputs into the realm of mathematics by introducing two sets, namely an input and an output set, where each entry in the input set is mapped to an element in the output set. In Knuth's definition, these sets are called i and omega, respectively, so let's stick to these names. Furthermore, we could formally define these two sets by expressing what elements are present in these sets. Now, the elements in these sets depend on the algorithm you are defining, but in our example, the input set contains all possible lists of integers and the output set contains all integers. So, could that be it? Have we defined what an algorithm is in mathematical terms? Unfortunately, we are omitting one vital set, which only becomes apparent when we inspect how the max algorithm could be implemented inside a computer program. So, let's break down our max algorithm in computer implementable steps. The following flowchart would be one way to implement our max algorithm. To get a little bit of a feeling for why this flowchart is correct, we will consider an example. Let's say the list 251 from before. Let's now go through all these steps from top to bottom. Step 1 tells us we need to define a variable called max and assign it to the value of the first element from our input list, in our example 2. Next, we also need to define a new variable called iteration and assign it the value 0. To keep track of these values, let's note them down. From now on, we will call the current values of our variables the state of the algorithm. Now, step 2 is a conditional statement. That tells us we need to check whether our iteration variable does not equal the length of our input list minus 1. When this is not the case, we end the algorithm by returning the current value of max, else we proceed by incrementing the iteration variable by 1. By inspecting our current state, we can conclude this would be equivalent to checking if 0 is not equal to 2. Therefore, the condition is true 
which means we go to step three that tells us we need to increment the iteration variable. Step four now tells us we need to check whether the next item in the list is bigger than our currently found maximum. Namely, is five bigger than two? And since this is the case, we update our max variable and return to step two. We could execute these steps until we return a value, which means the algorithm has produced an output. It then becomes apparent why our current definition is not yet complete. This notion of breaking everything down into computer implementable steps has required us to introduce this notion of a state. More concretely, a state could be defined as the intermediate variables and steps required to produce the correct output associated with the input. Now, how do these states fit into our current mathematical definition of an algorithm? We could just at a third set and call it states, right? And while this is a totally valid option, maybe it would be more elegant to view the inputs and outputs as states as well, namely initial states and final states. Then we could define the input set i and the output set omega to be a subset of the states set. So let's do just that. And while we are at it, Let's call it Q to be consistent with Knuth's definition. Let's now look at our example list 251 in the realm of mathematics. Instead of mapping an input directly to an output, we will now see all intermediate states that describe the values of all variables instead of just the input and output variables. And while this is the full definition, as far as all sets we need to consider are concerned, the mathematicians among us would still classify this as lack of rigor. Because up until this point, we have constantly manually added these arrows to map input states to internal states and internal states to final states. So what we really want is a so-called transition function that allows us to transition between states in a systematical and predetermined way. This function will take as an input any state from the set Q, remember this also includes initial and final states, and outputs the next state, also in Q. So considering the example from before, we could provide this function with the initial state that consists purely of the list 251. And this function would then output the state associated with step 1 from our flowchart, namely the max is assigned to the first element in the list and the iteration is assigned to 0. If we then input this outputted state back into our transition function, its output would be equivalent to the succeeding state. Concretely, it would be equivalent to incrementing our iteration variable and succeeding to that, updating our max variable. But a small problem arises with this definition. If Q also includes our final states, what will happen when we input a final state into our transition function? Because then the algorithm has already stopped and produced an output. Following Knuth's definition, we will define it such that in this case it will do nothing and just return the final state again. And we will classify this phenomenon as an algorithm termination. And because we like abbreviations, we will call this entire function f. As a side note, we can now mathematically define the state transitions defined by our f function as a sequence with elements x sub 0 up until x sub n, where n is the smallest number of transitions until we reach a state that is in the output set omega. To be even more rigorous, we could define the sequence via the following recurrence. x sub 0 can be any element in the input set, 
and each subsequent element from the sequence is defined by applying f onto the previous state. I wanted to show you this because it becomes apparent that for some algorithms our current f function could define an infinite sequence. In other words, an algorithm that will run forever and never terminate. We will now impose a restriction on the term algorithm to only be applicable to sequences that will terminate in a finite number of steps. So, okay, we now defined three sets, i, omega and q, all containing states, and we've described a function called f that tells us what state transitions are allowed. And now, as a last task, we define f in the realm of mathematics. We can define f as a piecewise function, which means we can change the behavior of our function based on our input. Let's first define what happens when we input an initial state into our transition function. As we saw in the flowchart, the first step is to define two variables, iteration, which should be assigned to the value zero, and max, which should be assigned to the value of the first element in the list. So let's define f so that when it receives an initial state, it will return a tuple with the list as the first element, the iteration variable as the second element, and the max variable as the third element. After that, we can now define our function when it receives a state that is not an initial state, because we know that in that case the input should be a tuple with three elements instead of a list. The second step in our flowchart was to check if the iteration did not equal the length of the list. If this were to be the case, we could increment the iteration variable else we should return the current value of max. Now the last step told us to check whether the next item in the list is bigger than our currently found maximum. If this were to be the case we should update our max variable, else we should leave the state as it was before. However, as you can see, I left a little space between the previous steps and the just-defined step. This is because two small problems have arisen. First, because the previous steps and the just-defined step both receive an input to pull with three elements, we cannot distinguish these inputs from each other in our piecewise function. Second, the flowchart tells us we need to go back to a previous step and currently we have no mechanism to achieve this. We can solve both these problems by introducing a fourth element to our state tuple, called the program counter. This variable indicates what step we are currently in. As a result, all steps can be distinguished from each other based on this number. And, because it is part of the tuple, we can just assign it to a previous number to allow us to go back to an earlier step. Lastly, we define our function to return the same value when it is presented with the final state. And that was it, the full mathematical definition of an algorithm. So, let's recall all of that on a high level. We have three sets, i, omega and q, all containing states. And we have a function called f that tells us, in a systematic way, what our next state will be after executing the next step. When you look at it in this way, it's not all that complicated. And that is what I wanted to show you in this video. A mathematical definition can sometimes be surrounded by a lot of technical terms and presented with so much generality that it is difficult to follow exactly which idea is being described. But if you throw in a simple example and move away from the technical jargon, the idea itself is not all that complicated. It's just described 
in a really rigorous language called mathematics. Thank you for listening.